I think I played one of the Ultimas on a friend's computer. Like I never had it myself, so it doesn't stick in my mind. I was a big Bardsdale guy, oh, yeah, yeah. and then I was kind of a gap there while I was in graduate school <laughs> until I started playing. I played Meridian Fifty Nine. Huh. The very first playing the Elder Scrolls series uh, pretty religiously as well as mostly in grad school I was playing uh, on the Super Nintendo because it was mm. such a pick up and decompress from the day kind of thing to do well uh, oh that was the I'm sorry that's our no <laughs> <laughs> we're back uh, classic quest after a uh, summer hiatus um, we are taking on the Ultima series um, last semester we took on a Calabeth Ultima 1 and Ultima 2 and uh, we're skipping over Ultima 3 not that it doesn't have any redeeming qualities but uh, maybe we just want to go for the uh, I guess I don't know if it's the flagship is the right word but it definitely stands out in everyone's mind here in the room, I guess, uh, as uh, really encapsulating a lot of the initial vision for the Ultima series. So anyway, Classic Quest, we're looking at classic RPGs. Uh, my name's Chris. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, and I study computer games. And I'm Thomas Malaby. I'm a professor of anthropology here at uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. I've uh, studied offline games, uh, online games, especially as they relate to institutions. And uh, I'm Scott Bruner. I'm a PhD um, student as well. Uh, my specialty is ludic narratology. So um, the way that Ultima IV actually tells the story is actually extremely interesting to me. I don't, yeah. Hmm. So why, why Ultima IV? I felt like I was kind of speaking out of turn there. Like, uh, for, me, for me, Ultima Four was, was one of the first PC games, but there's more to it than that, I feel. Well, I, I have a hard... I mean, it, it, I think one of the things that, you know, we've kind of run into a number of times we're playing some some of these games is to just pull in the, the nostalgia factor out of it. Uh, it's impossible for me not to see this screen and think... I played it on... You know, way back, I actually brought the original copy that I got for Christmas. When I, geez, I was. You hold that up. On you. Yeah, this is still my favorite of any game. I think uh, my favorite cover. So the artist is Denis Loubet. Um And when I, you know, the other thing I think that's striking about the box is, I think we mentioned this in Ultima Three too, is that there's the back of the box and there's not a single picture of, you know, there's no screenshot of of Ultima. Uh, of, of the actual what it lo actually looks like on your Apple II or your yeah. PC, whatever you're playing. Um, I mean, the, this game has been, I, I, you know, to be fair, I think I, I don't know how many Twitches are out there of actually people playing it. So I do think that's kind of novel in our approach. But this game certainly has been dissected uh, a number of times, and I think even in academic contests. Although I'm not that familiar with them, um, I, only that I've read a lot about this game, and the, so I'm. I think the reason for that is it has such an unconventional approach, which is this is one of, a f you know, this was the first game, I think, that came out at its time in the 1980s, where it's completely diverging from the formula of you're going to, you know, level up a party of adventurers and go try to take out um, some type of evil villain, which was the exact same plot of Ultima 1 to 3. It's a plot of all of the wizardry, well, except for wizardry, f except for Return of Word now, most of the wizardries. Um, in this game, you are literally there is no baddie to fight. There's actually this world you have just Adventure defeated. To go try to take Ooh. out. Um, sometimes you have just de no worries. You have just defeated um, the is it Exodus in the third game, and so now you're entering this kind of time of what's I, supposed to be peace and prosperity. And in order to do that, you're supposed to lead the land into this golden age by becoming. An avatar of perfect of these eight virtues that Richard Garriott would come up with. So the game, while it does still have a lot of the conceits of role-playing games, including dungeons, fighting, um, you know, resource management, um, has this strange ethical quest that you're on, and I think that's what interests people so much about it. Um, and it was extremely. When I was a kid, I mean, everybody had a copy of this game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was saying this was 
the I would say the first computer game. I I had an Atari growing up, but this was the first game that really demonstrated. I think I must have been well, whatever fifth grade was. Um, what games were capable of. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it, you know, it's, I think nostalgia is certainly part of it, but I think that's propelled, um, motivated my own interest in how games articulate a, a sense of place. And for, uh, I think last semester I talked ad nauseum about how Garriott created Ultima out of both a desire to get away from some of those uh, tropes that you mentioned, the, the, the dungeon delving and the, the combat, but also he wanted to recreate that sense of community that he um, felt in his first tabletop role-playing game groups. And they're, they're, they live on, and I'm assuming most of these players are are still with us, but uh, you know they're they're in this in these games. You know the the old uh, um, what is it the creative anachronism society creative, society. creative <laughs> anachronism. You know they they all they're all here. So or many of them are. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I think one of the things that people also often mention about Quest of the Avatar is that not only was it kind of you know this idea that you're that you're on a spiritual quest, not necessarily one where it's just a, just basically about you know combat and violence. Um, was so new at the time. What I think is interesting is it hasn't really. I mean, this is this game is coming out before I think in many ways role playing games mechanics and aesthetic concerns have been completely codified. Like the is the only because not only is this new and I should have the year for when this came out. I want to say 1985. Um, uh, you know, games hadn't codified into what they're going to be. You know, as a commercial enterprise, Garriott still this game. One of the things that I would we had just been speaking about um, Jimmy Maher's site, the Digital Antiquarium, which was my favorite site, does a, a good historical analysis on how, um, you know, how this game was created. Um, and one of the things that was really interesting from that is the point that this game was not tested by anyone but Richard Garriott himself. Um, and that's something that could obviously could have kind of only happened in 1985. He also mentions that there were a lot of other interesting games that came out. He mentions Balance of Power by Chris Crawford and Mind Forever Voyaging, a text adventure game, an interactive fiction game by uh, Infocom that came out at the same time, which was a game about... Both of those were explorations of politics, and both were sold on your regular gaming shelf. I remember, I mean, I picked up a Balance of Power um, for my Apple II, and these were games that I was playing. I played Ultima at the same time I was playing Balance of Power, which was a game about the balance of power in liminal zones between the Soviet Union and, and, uh, and the United States. Anyway, I'm going off topic. But I, th I think it's interesting that this game is a representative of how games were kind of experimenting in a lot of ways that that opportunity existed in 1985. Well, there's also a, again, just looking up, War Games came out in 83. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's this point where games are also, uh, maybe the creators are having, are a little bit on the defensive. And so they're trying to they're trying to pose these interesting, like this is what ca yeah games are capable of destroying the world a la Hollywood, but um, they're also capable of so much more um, and not so insidious ends. Um, well, I mean, there's so there's so many directions you can go with it. it. You know, one read of it, you could say about the shift that he makes, is well, you know, both don't both of those ways of creating Ultima games, one with the big baddie, the other with the kind of uh, working on the self, aren't they both, you know, under our, the way we currently talk about it, both just sort of saturated with, with being privileged, you know, getting to have the extra resources to go somewhere and kill a bunch of bad guys and save the world, or getting, because you have the leisure and the peace and all that, and this is one of the things I like the blog post for, I think he... He points to this a little bit, you know, the, the luxury of getting to work on yourself, <laughs> you know, in a way, either way, there's a kind of modernist, you know, uh, self that's, that's on display from that reading. It's not the only reading you can give, but I think it's, it's kind of interesting because either way, the, the actor, the agent is, is very clear, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. At, at a time where, uh, our, our West,
Western policies of, you know, uh, colonizing other lands is becoming under increasing scrutiny. Right. So we're starting to, you know, look at like how do we? I I'm hemming and hawing about this because this is something I'm I'm finding myself trying to figure out is how do we did this kind of come up at a time where our, is there an inherent desire for questing? Mm. Do we have this kind of tendency is it ingrained in us and if our the conventions to travel across waters and take over new lands, conquer new peoples is no longer in vogue do we find these new, is this our solution. Well, I think that, that is such a fascinating segue to what I was just talking about. I would like to now make a commercial for my class, English 294 Game Culture, <laughs> coming to you this semester. But um, I've signed uh, my students to play um, two games, Chris uh, William Crowther and Don Woods' Colossal Cave Adventure, the first mm. text adventure of all time, and then follow it up with Atari 2600, which technically was supposed to be a console reimagining of the original game. And one of the questions I asked them is why... Um, and, you know, and Zork would follow as well. A game just was just as successful. Obviously, we're talking about the interactive field. But the the first, you know, these first games were actually called Adventure, mm -hmm. um, Colossal Cave Adventure. Of course, you're, you know, um, spelunking through the caves, of, the Mammoth Cave system in Kentucky. Um, but it, it, and Adventure is, you know, a kind of simplistic Atari port of that idea. But you talk about colonizing, and all these games have the same central conceit of going to a new area, a new alien area, and looting it of its riches, uh, which Zork, of course, would take as well, right? So in, I, I, I signed it for my students, but I have to play Colossal Cave Adventure as well. I know more about <laughs> it than actually playing it. Um, but if, if I do remember it correctly, you know, it is, it is one where you, the, the scoring system is based on how many uh, objects, you know, uh, treasures you can bring back to the star, which exactly, you know, ends up in Zork as well. So if we talk about imperialism, there's a strange little... You can make that that these first games were imperialism trainers. And, well, yeah, and, and let's just fill out the picture a little bit with some of the other kinds of early computer games that were in the midst of the time. I was just looking at one of my absolute favorites, you know, a game that brought me to tears and many other people to tears, which is Planetfall, right? Mm -hmm. With the wonderful robot that you get to know, whose name, unfortunately, is... Floyd. Floyd. <laughs> you know, that that's a game where the, the setup is a, is a contingent event, you know, just a pure accident that throws you, a lowly kind of everyman, into a situation with almost no resources, mm -hmm. and you're just trying to survive. Think about how different that is than being the sort of the center of a, of a virtuous quest to become an avatar or being a colonizer, right? There, there's also that kind of trope, and there's certainly the kind of mystery and puzzle solving kind of version as well, right? Mm -hmm. What happened here kind of games. So I just think it's interesting that there was a there was a little bit of a, a collage of these different kinds of games, some more sort of expressive modern individual, maybe some a little less. I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting that these games are, both, both are kind of touching on this, but, you know, talking about how it's a response to, the response of what the games, that these games can respond to it. So, you know, uh, Richard Garrett is responding to some of the murder hobo-ish criticisms yeah. he got in <laughs> Ultima 3, right? He's like, he's like, oh, kids are playing my games, you know, maybe I can do a little bit more. And, of course, this is, this is the area, of the, this is a little bit past... About three, three, two, four years past the D and D, you know, the Egbert scares, this right. D and D Satanism scare. So this is right. some response to that. I find it interesting in today's game field, at least at the AAA level. I don't know if it's, that's true on the independent level. If somebody was to, lo you know, levy a, a complaint against this game, is much too violent. It's, it's, you know, you're not for the people would be like, this just a game. You know, that would be the response mm -hmm. now. But in 1985, this is one of the biggest commercial games of 1985. Is a response to the response from earlier games. So it's part of that kind of social conversation that in some ways, at least at the AAA level, conversations, uh, games don't respond to conversations. And, and even, and, and that just, just as a footnote to that really, I mean the, the whole kind of ethical dodge of the it's just a game, while always available, <laughs> it is, is always, you know, uh, disingenuous to a certain extent. Right. You know, uh, it was Dan Norton, the wonderful, uh, one of the founders of Filament Games in Madison, who wrote on a Terra Nova post, you know, some 10 years ago now, when people were starting to, because in that crowd, you know, this is a virtual world blog, and 
you know, you get a crowd that was very pro-game, you know, and they were ready to sort of throw under the bus uh, some of the academic work on violence and addiction, you know, from the early 90s and things like that, and felt themselves very much opposed to it, and much more on the James Paul G kind of side of things about games. is, And, and Dan comes in and Dan says, wait, 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 wait. We don't get to have it both ways. <laughs> you don't get to say that games are both a site of, of meaning and, and maybe growth and learning and that they're powerful in that sense. And then they're not, that they're also completely powerless mm. on the negative side mm-hmm. of the equation. You, you know, you don't get to say both those things. If, if, if we're saying that they, they have some effect outside of the moment of playing mm-hmm. on who we are, then we better do a lot better than just sort of dismissing one, one valence of the claims and accepting the other, yeah. you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't... We hadn't gotten to that point where we recon... We may not have yet gotten to the point where we recognize games as culturally significant. Mm. Um, I don't recall that being... Certainly wasn't the case when this when yeah. these, you know, mid-'80s... Uh, they're a subject of fear. The same way yeah. the film was, you know, they're one of those things that's just, a, hmm, is it powerful or not? Yeah. There's this deep ambivalence mm-hmm. around them, uh, and still, for sure. And it's interesting, I, I, I've i always thought of the Ultima games as indie games, but I never referred to them as such. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you call them AAA, because, I, yeah, I guess they were, I mean, you, you bought them mm-hmm. in Babbage's and... Yeah. Uh, Toys R Us yeah. and all this stuff, but I never, I, I still, I don't, I still think of them as indie games, um, and I don't know that. I mean, that's a, I guess that's a different conversation. Yeah. Um, I tend to think that the the AAA titles are more of an aberration than. Well, that's because I mean the the, the studio system didn't exist. Right, you know, I mean right. this is and more it's like still close yeah. to its creators, kind of vision and project, sorry. No, no, I mean, the fact that it wasn't tested, I mean, it is, I was thinking of, like, Melies or somebody else, but even that was actually, even the, even the studios are encroaching at that point as well. But well, I, I'm reviewing a piece right now for a journal, and it's, um, it's, one of its better qualities is that it, it does a little bit of grunt work as far as laying out how these um, game studios work, and they're very different model. Still to this day, they're there's something that um, you don't see too often in other industries. Uh, just a very, very diverse. No one has a title. Just uh, so this is a like a very. I mean, these are early products of that. Yeah. So anyway. Well, we should play it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was, yeah. So 1985. I don't know. This isn't written in machine code anymore. I don't think. I should have read the. Usually there. So this is a the version from Good Old Games, and uh, so it's running on DOSBox. Can't do a whole lot off screen with this because if I move off of it, it'll it'll reduce the screen size. Um, one of the things that and is it? I mean, you could speak to this screen uh, as far as a window within a window. There's this very like very Frankenstein quality of this. I can't remember the term for that, but uh, I almost wonder how long you could watch this before it repeats. There's all sorts of things going on. But uh, when first reinstalling this, maybe about a year, year and a half ago, um, I think I stared at it because I simply couldn't remember, how do I get off this screen? (laughs) (laughs) Um, So luckily... Commands, right? And by us playing the IBM version, we do not have sound. Um, uh, it was on earlier. Was it? Okay. Yeah, I turned it down earlier because it's that crackling sound when the Ultima. All right. By what name shall we be known? How about Chauncey? By virtue of being first. <laughs> Male or female. Female? Why not? Yeah, I think with this game, whoever's sitting in the driver's thing is just going to have to go with what they're thinking. Cause oh, yeah, is, with the whole virtue thing. Yeah, it, I mean, it's positioned to be a rather personal little experience here. And yeah, we shouldn't do it as a collective, I agree. So, 
Chris, you're you're on. Okay. Your, your virtue project begins. I just heard about this RPG. Um, oh, I can't remember what it was called. John's RPG or something, where everyone in the group plays. You're all playing the same character, but you're all playing different voices in his head. Hmm. Has anybody heard of that? Oh, uh, uh-uh. uh. Like, like inside out. Yeah. Well, you know, this is fun. a this is a much broader theme that I thought about bringing up before when you were speaking, Scott, which is the rise in academia, and there's some really great stuff on it in uh, anthropology, um, trying to get us to move beyond the notion of a continuous self when we write about human experience, right? That there have been people like Catherine Hales is one of them who have said things versus the patterned self versus the present self. That always in human history, we've got both a continuous idea of a self that is the same throughout time, and wherever my signature is, there I am in some fashion. And there's also a notion of a discontinuous self that ah, I could be different tomorrow. I could take on a different role. I could become a mother. I could be, you know, whatever it is. Um, so anyway, I just think about that with, with these sorts of games, and you just mentioned this one. Right now, we're in a moment where there's a kind of fragmenting now of the notion of a coherent unitary continuous self going on and I'm not surprised to hear it in reflected in game design well I mean this game illustrates that because there I mean this is one of those first games that gives you those ethical choices and they stick um, you have a few moments and there's one I can think of in particular where if you fail this small test of virtue uh, you basically fail you can't Complete right. the game, right. uh, so there is there is this very continuous kind yeah. of contracting, you know, lock in <laughs> contracting self. You know what what Michael Lambeck, who has a great piece on this, calls uh, the forensic self versus the mim- mimetic self. Hmm. Uh, I'll I'll link to his uh, his article, which is really good. So then it starts out with this sequence, which I I think I could play this uh, ad nauseum because. Uh, I love the. Well, we'll get to it. But it it starts you off by asking you for a series of uh, questions, and then your you, your character is created from these questions. And I think it's important to note that there's two realities, right? Like we are actually unlike a Bard's Tale or Wizardry, where it's it's all happening in the world of, I don't even know what the name of words or reason world would be in the Proving Grounds of the Matter Overlord in the first one. This is actually we are supposed to be playing ourselves in a real contemporary world. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we suddenly become an avatar. I mean it and the term avatar, I mean I I had heard the term avatar obviously when this game came out and I, I had my own idea, but I thought avatar meant was another word for hero. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, twenty, thirty 30 years later, we're using the term avatar, and of course it means closer to what it actually means, you know, something that you kind of inhabit and, and possess, uh, which now makes sense when I go back to this, but at the time I didn't even get that, but I'm, I guess I'm just trying to give Garrett a little love for being a little ahead of the ahead of the curve on the idea that we are creating alternate selves in these games. Oh, these going. graphics are great. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> if you play this with headphones, it makes a growl. Yeah, sound. maybe the sound is As I mentioned, Garriott had a fascination with those portals due to his love of Terry Gilliam's Time Bandits. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm. Crude circle of stones. <laughs> Very, uh... Such amazing, like, you know, collisions of European mythology and <laughs> these things. Like, here we have a little miniature Stonehenge. We're getting, you know, the name of the land, and this is going to be Britannia, but it's all over the place. It's not just, you know, British, it's mm-hmm. Irish folklore. I, I was just reading here a second ago that there's a song in here written by a famous Irish folk musician. I don't know. It's, it's interesting, but all very European. Well, it is. I mean, it's, and this is, there. there's your throwback to Dungeons and Dragons. Right. It's kind of an amalgamation of all sorts of things, you know, cherry picking from these myths and right. uh, Tolkien. Is there any other RPG where we are playing ourselves becoming an avatar in another game? Like, as part of the actual gameplay? I can't think of one. Oh, I know there's gotta be, right? 
Say that again. So what? like, what if you played World of Warcraft and you you played the game and you were somebody sitting in the thing and then you you know it said oh you find a portal and now you are in right. Azeroth right? right where that that conceit happens right yeah. where okay. you're where the framing is that it's you sitting there at the computer oh and now this happens to you and you're thrown into a different mm-hmm. and context. you're even inhabiting your Azerothian character as you you know yeah. like it is still actually you despite the fact that you are comfortable maybe somewhere else could you argue that any first person game does that you probably argue anything but yeah uh, yeah i don't know well there's yeah i think there is a subtle but maybe maybe important difference between a game that starts you find yourself in a room right and it's talking to you as if mm-hmm. it's you and the room that says hey you there at the computer and they the game that says hey you there at the computer this is what you're doing today mm-hmm. and now then this happens and now you find yourself in another space right yeah there's there's a neat horror game I've been uh, I mentioned it to Leia the other day uh, uh, what the heck strange stories um, but it's this horror game where you supposedly you're you go up to a house and there's this computer on this I mean you're on the screen there's a computer like an old I can't remember what you what you call them what, like the unibody not a Mac, but anyway. So you start playing this game, and it's just a text adventure, and the things that happen that occur on the text adventure are happening around you, and these little uh, small changes. Right. So that's kind of a but. Playing with the fourth wall yeah. in that way. As a kid, by the way, I hated this conceit. I didn't like it at all. Hmm. What the. Uh, the idea that I was playing kind of myself jumping into it, that I couldn't create my own character, that I was mm. playing a representation, an avatar of my actual person. Apologies for not reading through this. <laughs> you read oh, the book of history. We're going to have to all sit and read this now. It's going right. to tell you that you have to. Yeah, I mean, the, so there is. I love that. I love <laughs> that. <laughs> right, right? Yeah, speaking of, right? Yeah, you really got to do this. Yeah. It's worth mentioning for anyone not familiar, uh, most of the Ultima games came with a wealth of bits and pieces, yeah. and, uh, paratext, uh, cloth map, little tokens. Uh, I think one, I can't remember which game had coins that came with it. This one came with an onk. I think yeah. your copy still has the onk, correct? Yeah. I have, mine has been lost to the ages, I'm afraid. Probably on the probably on a, on a silver chain around someone some, <laughs> yeah. some mall in 1987 so yeah it has this book of history which there's a lot of work is done with regards to the lore um, you know and I, as an English major I, I always go where are the writers when it comes to games and I think I think I can't, what publisher it was said writing comes last you make the game, and the writing is the, is the last thing. But the so, writing, which is which mirrors, by the way, product development in the technology sector in general. Interesting, right? You write the manual last. And it's the thing that nobody wants to do. And you talk to anyone in technical writing here, you know, there's a whole history of that, right? So mm-hmm. I think in in a way that we're very ready to overlook, uh, so much of computer game design and production was shaped by engineering production not even just computer engineering production and that's one of them yeah and we're interesting there's a new book out of i think mit press about this uh emergent discipline of storytelling uh uh, uh, corporate storytelling Mm. Uh, Mm. and worked with someone over the summer who whose husband works at a business nearby uh very prominent business and uh, his position was replaced by someone taking on this lead storyteller. That's this person's title, <clears throat> and that, that to generate like a PR position. So it is What's nice story. Yeah, it is. Well, nice you to hear see. it everywhere. Yeah, you know, Project Runway. They they don't like an outfit that comes down the runway. I don't understand this person's story. Yeah, With, you know, it's that kind of corporate speak. Uh, well, I came back. I mean, I came from nonprofit development and communications, and I was managing. Oh, really? You know, yeah. Uh, communications platform for a nonprofit in San Francisco that were made nameless and that's what they call the new person is the storyteller yeah um, that's the idea is to, is to collect all the stories of the people that have been affected by this nonprofit and the fact that it's called storyteller I think you know, it sounds like the 
They should be a bard, and they should have a lute. Well, that's right. such a such a big relationship. Sorry, one more <laughs> parenthetical uh, to um, the nonprofit sector and fundraising and development. Right, even a, a place like UWM too. It's it, and I, my wife worked at a very prominent foundation for a while as well. And you know, at a certain point, the um, you know the, you end up with just at that level, at the very high level of fundraising and things like that with either a kind of metrics-based kind of, you know, what's the benefit of giving this money to this organization? What are we seeing in return? It's a very met metricized measure. And then that's in, in a kind of dialectical tension with an idea of stories. Mm -hmm. I just want to hear the stories. Come to me with a good story. You go to the president of the foundation, you tell them a good story. That's what catches their attention. And it really is that, that contrast between sort of narr the narrative logos and saturated with meaning and the empty, rationalized you know, but, but functional utilitarian numbers. Yeah. yeah, and I would be interested in tying that in with what you were saying before about uh, Kate Hale's notion of the self. Um, without a, right. you know, what do I do as without a narrative to right. kind of justify these decisions that I've made? Well, another one that comes in that's very, very important, which is neither of those things, is site visits, mm -hmm. right? So site visits are metonymic. You know, yeah. they're about presence in Kate Hale's point of view, right? Being there, mm -hmm. walking through, there's nothing that replicates walking through the nonprofit that you may give a grant to, right? That would, to me, that's how I would map her, her pieces onto okay. that more. That the pattern, within the realm of the pattern, there's the storytelling it's, uh, that we were just talking about, and there's also the kind of storytelling through numbers. Mm -hmm. And both of those are abstracted from situated in the moment experience, metonymic present experience but the site visit is 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 in contrast to both of those yeah you know so anyway we could go on and on about this kind of thing but you know, I think it's 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 interesting to think about how games are trying to toe that line all the time they're trying to, to strike that balance they know they've got if they if they've got a good game that captures their players attention which maybe is part of the answer to why the writing comes last you've got the moment Right? Mm -hmm. That's what you're going for. You're going for the, for the moment that is mm -hmm. commanding the attention of the player. And the kind of the narrative around it is, is in some sense out of that moment in time and in tension with it. But. Yeah. Uh, well, they rely on the visual. Loot like sound wafting over in your way. Why is it hauntingly familiar? All right. I mean, this is kind of interesting. The the fa the fair. Um. Well, we could bring up Shakespeare here and talk about the you know the fact that you are walking away from society into the forest, into the area where you can be you know irrevocably changed. But mm -hmm. that. and to the kind of carnival or the the bacchanal kind of yeah. suggestion where the rules are different. I think this is. I don't remember what the store the color palette for Ultima Three was, but if. I would be willing to bet there's a huge leap. I know there's a there's a leap between two and, and mm -hmm. four here, yeah. but this is this is breathtaking for 1980. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that something in in the uh, that blog post? What, I'm sorry, what's his name again? Jimmy Marr. Marr. Yeah. You know, he mentioned Italy. That Garriott at some point mentioned this is a bit like a Renaissance Italy, right? Mm. Look in the upper left there. That's the the famous place in um, Florence. Uh, it's got the same architectural details and the bright pink colors hmm. of that famous building, which is, I'm just escaping me right now, but on the, the main uh, piazza in Florence. Interesting. There's no ordinary traveling carnival, but a Renaissance fair. And now we spent spell fair with an extra E. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're uh, in southern Wisconsin. <laughs> we just went again this year. It was really wonderful. They had the Royal Falconer back, which I love. Mm. That's why we were talking about that the other day. Yeah. Ren Fair. See, yeah. I already get to call it a Ren Fair back then. All right. Music continues to pull you forward amongst the merchants and vendors. All right, here we go. Well, now we have the ubiquitous archetypal gypsy. Mm -hmm. The ankh around her neck. Oh, well, why, out of all these colors, they couldn't get a decent flesh tone? Right. right. All right. Room smells so heavily of incense that you feel dizzy. 
Okay. Okay, so now here's where it, it gets interesting. Um, How many times have you actually played through the sequence in your life, Chris? I would say at least two dozen. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> more I'm more interested in this sequence than the actual game itself, to be honest. I've never finished the game. Yeah. No, well <laughs> I've evidently it's almost impossible. Um, yeah, we we'd had conversations about Ultima One and Two about, you know, like the fact that I I was looking forward to playing Ultima Four because I wanted us to finish it and get through it. But after reading it it takes hundred and fifty to two hundred hours and parts of it are almost impossible to complete without some hidden knowledge. Anyway, but I have to look it up. I recently heard that there was a very, it was much faster if you just, if you are, if you know the secrets, if you know what yeah. to do. Um, but that's eh, not fun. Yeah, 120 hours is a little much. But I, but I'm, I'm with you. When I played this as a kid, I, I must have rebooted it a hundred times and didn't. Just to do this. Well, this, there's a significance to the choices. And I don't think even, like, uh, Colossal Cave Adventure does the same thing where you're like, there's always that what what did I is it or Espen Orsif does that talks about that a lot in cybertext a lot right where there's all with every choice there's always the choice that you didn't choose mm -hmm. and so there is with something like this where your experience is supposedly reliant on these choices that you're making. Uh, but the, and I'm not convinced that it actually is though. I'm not sure that this sequence actually does anything for the game. It mechanic. I mean, the only thing I know mechanically that it does is it's, it chooses your character class, right? Um, oh, okay. One of the things I have to fudge every if I do this exactly who I am, I always end up with a shepherd, and not to. <laughs> it's like really. Mm -hmm. So I fudge it a little bit because I and if I think of fudge it or is it the shepherd I get the tinker, um, <laughs> and, and neither class which, which companions you get. Yeah. In other words, yeah. you get the seven companions that are that don't match the one yeah. that are the number one. So. Tinker, yeah, that's what I get. Tinker. Um, but I think beyond mechanics, I think that's about that's about what it does. But it is. But your note, your stats aren't different, other than what is associated yeah. with the class. So. Thou dost manage to disarm thy mortal enemy in a duel. He is at thy mercy. Dost thou show compassion by permitting him to yield or slay him as expected of a valiant duelist? See, it's, it's already, you can parse this and you can see there's, you know, you're demonstrating a virtue or do you do what's expected? Yeah. Right? So that that already sets valor up at a kind of a disadvantage, you know. it's just mm -hmm. That's just social convention. That's not something higher, you know, so... I think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there. What's What's difficult about these games? You have to kind of put aside any um, any prejudice towards like what good these games are doing is how limited their de Gary and, and company's definition is of oh, compassion. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> Compassion for those who obviously need it, the beggars. Well, even just the systemization. I mean, the, the, the Mar piece really does a nice job of this. You know, like, there's that, again, that engineering mindset, which I think informs so much of computer design, game design, that there's got to be a, this has, this has to be system, systemic, right? Systematic, mm -hmm. right? We've got to be, have, there's a way to organize all of this, right? Just like Richard Bartle, you know, who uh, I consider a, you know, a dear friend and I, I love the stuff he says, but you know, he comes up with this system for players. It's just what an engineer would come up with, yeah. right? It, it, it organizes everything in such a, a neat and tidy, rationalized, Weberian way. You know, what of that's the, the deeper what, problem. Isn't it for the four categories yeah. of players? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a. I, I, mean, I want to know what you're going to choose, Chris. Um, well, I would. I would typically choose compassion, just because if, if I were playing. But I would also be interested in seeing if we can push yeah. this to towards a. So I'm going to uh, select I like B. It. B. Yes. Not that we're voting or anything. <laughs> okay, honesty and. So I wanted to make a mention because we were talking about how, you know, I'll, I'll be quick, you don't have to pause, for, although now I <laughs> see your interest to this too, is the important, like one of the things that just reading, like I, I read the Maharbeef just, just before I came up here, and, um, we've talked about, a lot about how the ultimate games create a world, 
uh, not through actually the mechanical gameplay, but by all of the little artifacts here that we can touch mm -hmm. and see that kind of create this idea. The fact that it, it admonishes you, you have to read the history of Britannia. Something that no one would probably do in a AAA game these days. Like, literally, if you're going to pick up an RPG, you just want to jump into the game and hope that the exposition of the world is given in the game. You know, one of my favorite RPGs of all time, Morrowind, often people say that it's not accessible because so much of the of the background is you have to read it, right? But I what I felt it was murky. <laughs> <laughs> I, <coughs> but what I what I'm getting away from what I wanted to say is like the modern piece was actually I was watching it like irritate me not because anything he said was wrong, but because it was peeling away some of the mystery that I had of this game. He was talking about some of the mechanical deficiencies, mm -hmm. the fact that there are puzzles and riddles in the game that <clears throat> you can't solve because he made because there are bugs that don't give you the answer to these riddles, right? Mm -hmm. I believed in this game. I mean, I believe without the pictures on the back of the box with this amazingly um, evocative picture of this mm -hmm. character that I was going to become, that ultimately, I, I believed it's, it's in Richard Moses like it's Jesus <laughs> like it. I mean, it's a whole bunch of different things at once. And there's, there's, no, there's no combat, there's one character, and, right. it's, and he's powerful, and I don't, I don't know what, I'm so excited by... And I always believe that there's this amazing, you know, fantastic mystery at, at, the, at the core of all of it. And I think... These things that might not have mechanical, the idea that we've got, he's, he's drawn out the cards for us here in this, you know, kind of Apple II level graphics. He's got these questions that he spent some time, they're awkward, but again, when I was playing this when I was 14 or 13 or however, it would totally work. I mean, I believed that this game was literally make, going to make an ethical, ethical, not moral judgment on who I was, and that was going to have ramifications throughout the game. I absolutely believed. And again, that I was probably the perfect you know, audience for this game. So, in 1985, for its audience, it certainly works. Yeah, I mean, I've, I always thought, like, the, the whole, like, refer to the book, um, that would seem to be in line with the anti-piracy mm -hmm. yeah. and things that uh, game developers would do. I, I remember the circle things. Starflight had a yeah. wheel, and there were, yeah. there were, like, if whatever spell well, on page. I have that had one of those, yeah. I remember those. There, I mean, they, games, parts of did Bart's Tale? Bart's Tale did something where I think you had to look at a certain page on the menu. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Honesty and Justice, I'm going to... I was thinking Justice because that seems to be more in line with, like, a... I'm thinking of, like, a Paladin type. Okay. Uh, any objections? Nope. I just don't like this Chauncey character. Sacrifice and spirit spirituality. Uh, boy. Well, let's see what we got. See, again, spirituality it seems more of the pious type of... It's not even a real virtue. Right. You know I mean? like, <laughs> like, because, look, the virtues, according to Aristotle, these are things that, that you are actions. You act upon, right? Mm -hmm. you, how do you know if someone's courageous? Well, you ask people, what does a courageous person do, you know? Well, what does a spiritual person do that that has almost no traction? Yeah, <laughs> on yeah what, you know what I mean. Like so. Well, it's like that. Well, when you ask someone, "Are you religious?" No, but I'm spiritual. Yeah, right. It's, like, it's an empty. <laughs> kind of thing. And and again, it, it. Well, this was talked about in the Mar piece as well. I mean, it. it the spirituality is a really strange thing to be kind of you know uniting yeah. all of these things. You know, and it it bespeaks a kind of. Uh, you know, I don't want to say anything about Richard Carey. I don't know the man, but you know, this sort of upper middle class, you know, yeah. Yeah, religion yeah. at a distance kind of thing. You know, well, that in the mindset of a twenty-something year old or whatever. Yeah. and old, engineering yeah. too, yeah. frankly, where a lot of that sort of yeah, I mean, you know, what pushing institutions away, especially church institutions, is is sort of part and parcel of what happens. Yeah, you would kind of hope the flavor text would help a little bit here, but follow thy spirit's call. I said, well, I mean. <laughs> That's pretty vague. Right. I, I'm going to go with sacrifice. Uh, honor. All right. Again, just going with the justice. Going with the... Hmm. Hmm. Sworn to the Lord's bidding and all. He puts a piece of land and orders the owner removed. So I, I was going to make, I, we, I, I mentioned Morrowind a little bit ago. Um, the Elder Scrolls games, I think both Daggerfall and Morrowind, both use a similar mechanic. Um, unlike 
Ultima Four, we're, we're supposed to be playing ourselves, and we're trying to figure out what we think about our own, um, you know, our own epics. Morrowind and, and uh, Daggerfall, both you're still playing another character, but they have a. S well, actually, you can choose your character class based on how you answer a number of questions that are similar. You to You can this. choose to go through that yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. right, and and the actions that you take in relation to certain quests will change the sort of the background of your character at times, right? Whether you or was that, that just if you became a vampire or a werewolf? I can't remember whether it was like Knights of the Old Republic in any respect, where it would sort of... I haven't played Daggerfall. It changed Fall. how people reacted to you. I did play Daggerfall. I know Pretty Morrowind, I think, yeah. I mean, I, all I know oh. for sure Morrowind is it suggests a class for me, based yeah. on my answers. And I found the questions in Morrowind to be really bizarre actually I didn't I didn't like them but it seems it's interesting it's different though too though right because those questions in Daggerfall and Morrowind are supposed to get you to a particular class how do you want to act in the world you yeah know, not yes. morally right right but like with what capacities mm -hmm. you know yeah. whereas these are not about class yes at least as far as you know as you go through it they are about you know how would you like to be morally positioned to, mm -hmm. to act and then your class is supposed to reflect a moral point of view yeah. instead of moral commitment. Yeah, that's thing. correct. Now uh, this takes on a different kind of uh, definition of class, though. I mean, this is uh, serve justice by refusing to act, thus being disgraced, or honor thy oath and unfairly ev evict the landowner. So there's this um, kind of a different understanding of justice than the previous card had right where I guess I had assumed a couple hands ago that justice was a what was handed down by the king right and now the king can be unjust and now this is justice is has is some kind of objective truth right so again the engineering speak what are you choosing it's just a game Sorry. um I think I'm going to go B. Okay. Because I think that's what your knight would do. Valor. Chauncey is lawful and neutral in the parlance of D&D. Yeah, it costs you. Interesting. Um, I would normally pick A, but I'm going to go with B on this one because it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you wonder to what extent are we, by looking to be counter-conventional, are we constructing a person who could exist at all? Well, yeah, well, yeah, this is someone who, uh, I mean, I, I guess... As I'm going through these choices, I'm doing the you know, abiding law and order, right. um, the the thin blue line, all that good stuff, and um, it. I mean, I I admit that it's very counterintuitive to kind of. It's very foreign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but yet yeah, you're suggesting yeah, you think we've got a, we're steering by a particular star at least. You know. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I buy it. I buy it. So that would be B, right? Yeah. I just want to see if they give me a shepherd or not. Right. There was this old test back in high school. You might, I don't know where you were at the time, but they were in Virginia, and they gave you this test, and it was like the SATs, ACTs, but it was right. more of a career-oriented, and everyone, out of the three choices, the three choice career directions that you were given, everyone got farmer. <laughs> it was the most <laughs> bizarre thing. Engineers, uh, budding engineers, budding artists, whoever, they were all destined to be farmers, according to this test. Uh, a bounty hunter. Well, it's murder after it's captured. We... I do wonder if the questions are different based on the way, because I don't think I've ever read this question before. I, mm. Well, they probably have, I mean, I'm sure they have a combination but, for each... Well, as you make certain choices that are counterintuitive, you're going to be confronted with unex things that they're unfamiliar later choices because it has to rank them, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Well, I'm going to honor my oath right. to return him as thou hast promised. 
So, so be it, thy path is chosen. Come on, big money, big money, big money. <laughs> Open your eyes to... Whoa! That doesn't look right. That's re It's loading in the uh, game. Let's hope so. Oh, there we go. <sighs> Chauncey, what are you? I think if you hit Z... You've got 300 gold. Then... You oh, are man, all right, strength 23. I just want to, <laughs> I want to be clear that I take issue with this. Uh, you are not lawful good. You Hooked are... up with a sword and chainmail right off the bat. Boom. <laughs> Why even play at this point? Yeah, I win. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so uh, graphical uh, user interface. And also mechanically determines where you begin the game because you are not standing near... Britannia. Oh, so we're out questing. Yeah. All right. So, what town is this? Trinsic. Yep. All right. So when I play Ultima Four, what I do is I list every single NPC. I may do this on my own. I list every single NPC and what they, and whether they will join or like. Uh, because you have to keep copious amounts when you play of notes when you play this game. Yes. Um, in fact, I picked up my copy of Ultima on eBay, and I surprised that I th there aren't more notes in there. Oh, there's a sound. Well, we get E on town, but we didn't get E on fair. Oh, I guess it's now because we're actually in the other world. Excuse me, I'm going to jump out the toilet faster. The tap. You can't have a uh, fantasy setting without a bar. I think it's mm. talk. Well, it's the third space. Somebody must have written that article already. About third space in RPGs and the importance of a, the quest tavern and D&D &D and, and then it's legacy yeah that would that would write itself um constance i think wrote one she wrote a piece on the third space yeah. but was it about the bar the sort of the no third space yeah see somebody could just do that and check off tick off a box in their cv <laughs> easy as falling out of bed <laughs> uh meet handsome fighter that's his name oh he is dupree yeah i if I remember right, he is someone that you can bring on. And I. Th you. I kind of enjoy the. Um, I'm r riding on 30 year old memories here. And town leader. Uh, so. Quest? <laughs> you do other quests in this game? Oh, yeah. Now, I think you were. I'm feeling Scott knows more about this than I do. Food or ale. So this was one where he says, I drink a toast to honor, and that gives you a clue that that might be something you can ask him about, one of the virtues. And then he gives you this little cryptic. Nothing? Nothing. <laughs> Ah. 
the shrine lies to the south and west beyond the swamp. So this is how you find these places. You, Scott, how many of these commands do you remember? Uh, I've got here's a list of you. Oh, I'll that's that handy. Scruffy merchant. I remember job name. Attack. Board. Past. Descend. Enter. Fire. Get chest, hole up in camp, night a torch, Jimmy Lock, climb with a K, locate position, mix reagents, new order, open door, appear at gym, click and save, radio weapon, talk, search, use, wear armor. As far as speaking, the three things you can ask folks about are name, job, and health, health. I believe. Yeah. yeah. Health? Yeah, job and health. I think health <laughs> rarely. You can look again at their visual description. A bit ragged out. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to ask Dupree about his job and he were to respond, I'm hunting gremlins, thou might think to ask him about hunting or gremlins, about either of which he might offer some hints of. So that is normally a would be a monster. I am Skittle. Why is it not a monster? Or is it? Maybe it is. It seems like a lost dungeon. <clears throat> so there's two. There's two halves to the game, and this I do. Lost know. Man. The first half of this game, of course, is to go and prove that you can embody the virtues that uh, Richard Garia has selected. You know, humility, truth, courage. I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, then once you do that, you go and then the game actually does become more like a dungeon crawler, because then you have to go into a number of dungeons to seek out the Codex of Ultimate Wisdom. But the first part of the game is nothing but exploration and talking and doing basically this. There will be a lot of combat uh, in the areas between towns. See, this is where notes would come in. Right there, I mean, yeah, there. So hope no one can speak. You can also look at him, too. Right from the bowl. That's the one up there. So you could go attack the bull. I don't know how Peter would feel about you just attacking a bull with your chainmail sword. I'll let it run away. You get a chest. How do you open a chest? Open oh, chest, maybe. Some of them are two words. G, get chest. Oh, 42 gold. So, <clears throat> my guess is because we have no way to. Virtue, probably, from that. Yeah. Explicitly see how that's impacting uh, its tracking, keeping a record of your virtues. I'm assuming one of them has just gone up. What? Oh, got uh, attacked by a guard. Is that because you destroyed the, a bull? Or yeah. damaged the bull? Oh boy. But, I, but, but I'm a paladin. <laughs> this is what you get for helping Come children. On. Some guy ran off. Hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Shining pellet. Solving the 
Let's bring the honor. So honor, maybe. Or intrinsic. Then solve quests, but attack not non-evil creatures. And get not others gold. Now, does that mean you're not supposed to take the gold from a monster if you kill it? So now that bull thing, that would have been, would have been helpful mm -hmm. before I attack the bull. But what would be the other option? Secret did we try? We did already. Oh, purple stone, right. Okay. Maybe there's something else. I wonder if. Because it was shame, right? Oh. Hmm. Try honor. Dave. Well, maybe if you go back to the skeleton now, do you have more options? say altars now. I'm going to have to open up Evernote soon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> to actually play through this game, like I said, you have to, you, I, I have to track every single NPC conversation. Um, but that's part of it, right? I mean, you're, yeah, that's part of how, how these games kind of impact uh, our experience outside of the screen. You know, the, yeah. the game becomes kind of a small portion of that. Especially in a game where you've got a, a cloth map yes. and all these other bits. This, this can, you can play Ultima 4 um, without even turning on the computer. Yeah. I uh, one of the things that Maher said in, in, in his in his, in his in his blog entry as well was about how as a game he doesn't find it particularly fun and I just I so completely disagree. I, I did attempt this game again about four years ago and I, like I said I put the maps out I get everything and I don't know what happened that I stopped because I got rather far into it. I still didn't get the part where I saw my first dungeon um, <laughs> and I put in forty hours into the game itself, but. There's, you know, we again are coming back. Whatever I guess a the theme is, you know, talking about the Elder Scrolls games. But you know, Morrowind is one of my favorite games because of its open world nature. And there's no way getting around the fact that this is, I think, an open world game for 1985. Right? You, uh, you are able to progress the quest in just about any. I mean, you there's the only roadblock to you doing just about anything right now is getting the mantras going to the. Cro proper altars and shrines in the proper order so that you can unlock the dungeon. So there's two distinct halves. There's one narrative roadblock in the middle of the game, but you can do those in any order. You can go to yeah. the, you can go to any town in any order. Uh, most of this is going to be exploration. And the combat is 
somewhat tedious, but it's not difficult. You know, you run into things. It's, there's more resource management than any type of tactical strategy yeah. at all, um, <clears throat> which seems to be true. And, of course, there we go. We have our friendly F again. We're having to monitor food, <laughs> which continues to be a bit of a nuisance in the Ultimate Games as it's constantly going down. What was it, a Calabeth, where you your health would go down almost immediately and it was a constant concern? Yeah. Where, well, this is much more forgiving. I mean, you can... It still does pass the time if you don't enter a keystroke, though. Yeah. I was just going to mention that uh, you're talking about how it involves you outside of the interface and taking notes, making notes, and things like that. It just reminded me, there's a nice piece by Alex Gola uh, about, it's called Being in the World of Warcraft. I, I linked it in the chat. And he is making a nice point about World of Warcraft that in the midst of lots of people kind of taking for granted it as a kind of, Im the idea of immersion, which is a problematic <laughs> category in so many ways. That that players are sort of, you know, occupied and immersed in this. And I see he points out all the ways in which it gets you looking across the web, gets you mm -hmm. doing all kinds of other things that are outside of the game itself, yeah. and that it's it's a very facile claim to suggest that you're you're losing yourself, you know, in only what's in front of you in the interface. Yeah, I every time I hear the word immersion, yeah. I I have to like think of Gordon Kaleha's incorporation yeah. uh, just to cleanse my mind <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. and he, was, he was in the guild as was Alex oh really yeah, that's <laughs> the stuff we were talking about Gordon for his PhD dissertation uh, he was in New Zealand he didn't really have people who knew games so Tim Burke and I were his kind of really? shadow advisors oh, behind the scene helping, helping him figure out these these issues yeah that was uh, that was a uh, I think I must have read is it in game must have mm -hmm. been about three years ago Two years ago, I like that book very much. It was it was just heartwarming yeah. it, uh, to to read because immersion is one of those words, especially without having the clout to kind of rail against it. Yeah, and you just kind of, at the at the point where in your academic career where you just kind of take everything as it comes and you haven't quite got a footing to to argue against it. Right, right. and here's some like oh incorporation. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we we were. It was so great to have him come along and be interested in talking about that. And uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed it because sometimes I wonder um, if that has sort of found some traction, like it should have. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Well, you know, I think I think there's a. I don't know if it's growing or what the status of it is, but um, you know, another thing about something like Ultima Four and Morrowind are these ethics in games mm -hmm. and uh, I think there's the games and philosophy research group uh, they, they tackle this a little bit but um, you know outside of puzzles games enable us to like we have been doing today kind of toy with alternative ethical s structures and mm -hmm. arenas and to a certain extent, you know, to the extent, uh, you know, but but mitigated by the fact that so often there are ethics written into the architecture that the game designers aren't aware of. Yeah. You know, which can really hobble any even explicit efforts to make a game sort of ethically rich and interesting. But I think I think it's such an such a great topic for games in general, not just computer games. Mm -hmm. uh, games as a site for uh, ethics and development of ethics and, uh, it's definitely one of my major interests right now well I mean famously I mean Garriott was a a victim of his own inability to kind of predict what ethical turns would kind of come about uh, in Ultima Online where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a bunch of players uh, took advantage of a uh, fluke in the programming and offed them <laughs> yep I've never seen what his response to that was. I, I have to hope that it was at least congenial. Well, you know, even in some like Ready Player One, there's this. See this kind of manifest this desire for the kind of. Homo 
Crayons, the godlike creator who gets to be, or the wizard of Lambda Mu, who gets mm -hmm. to be kind of above the rules, you know, and is either taken down or not taken down, but otherwise, either way, they get to be someone different from from everybody else. So hopefully he took it well. I think it's interesting, too, that, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about the fact that we play our actual selves as we're jumping into an avatar in the game, but the creator of the game is also... Um, represented in every one of the ultimate games. We're mm -hmm. always constantly going. And that's one of the things that I th that I, I thought was interesting too. You know, we talked a little bit about like this this colonialism is becoming this hero character, but we are not the king of this land. Um, in many ways, we're a, an average citizen who, I guess, we're not an average citizen. We're an interloper um, from right. another world who has come to. I guess that actually has imperialist overtones too. We're actually coming to save you know the citizens of Britannia. Um, the fact that the world has now changed with Cesari and Ultima 3, but now we are calling it Britannia, which certainly has even more imperialist overtones as well. It's kind of interesting. But, um, you know, not we, we are not in charge of this countryside. We're kind of, we're still subject to Lord British. We're still subject, both playing the game and in the game itself, to the country. gets frustrating about games is even you know you are beholden to the developers uh, point of view and whatever the context of that era is and, and their picture of what human beings are yeah and post-colonial colonialism I, I don't remember being certainly wasn't in my vocabulary at the time But now you have it being, you know, was it colonizer? Wasn't that an insult kind of thrown out there in uh, Black Panther, the, mm -hmm. the movie? <laughs> I can't remember what the conversation is when you when you meet Lord British in the in this game. Isn't there like were you summoned or? Well, I don't remember um, off the top of my head. I do know. I, I think it's interesting. I, I think he basically says. You know, try to go out and live the virtues of the Avatar. And he has a seer by the name of Hawk, if I'm not mistaken, who's in another part of the castle, and he gives you updates on your progress okay. on each of those virtues. I keep walking and wandering around hoping that I might see a landmark that will steer me towards Britannia, but I'm not. And that's what could get frustrating about this game is avoiding things, and you get to a point with like the fact the Final Fantasy syndrome, where you're just kind of get me through this without having to fight one more little annoying. Yeah, the number of uh, enemies, I guess, increases as your party increases. Of course, you'll be able to meet the companions that you need to solve the game. talk about mechanics and genres, this is, the first part of the game is really more adventure game than it is role playing game, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have much control over our statistics, um, basically we're trying to gather the correct items to use in basically a puzzle to open up the doors so that we can finally play the role playing game, which I would say is the mm -hmm. second half of the game. Do you remember, uh, there was a game that was on my roommate's computer, it was on, a, I think he had a Mac, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it was, it, the view was actually you're you're looking kind of 3D sort of in in dungeons and you're sort of turning left and right and you were just taking steps forward all the 
the time, a very clean interface, and it'd be like there'd be a snake sitting there, or there'd be like a lion sitting there. There was a game for the Macintosh early when um, that was called like the Crystal, the Crystal Tower. But that sounds so much. I mean, that doesn't. I mean, the a small little window, of course, showing your perspective in a dungeon. You know, what right. was your dream yeah, Mars yeah, tale like based that. on? And then Wizardry did that too. Yeah, but much more in a kind of blocky kind of way. Yeah. This is yeah. almost like a not vectors, but much cleaner. What was that? Maze. There was that maze game that I had asked you about last semester. I can't remember what it was. I wonder if that's it. Yeah, it was like it was like a maze. Yeah, you were definitely, and it had almost like a bit of a Egyptian tropes in it a lot. Dungeons of Daggerath? No. <sighs> that would be way preceding with a TRS-80. No. Oh, you said Egyptian, which in that direction. Person shooter made by Bungie that had an Egyptian theme. That was not a rule to go. There we found a new town. Well, Dark Castle we played a lot of. That was so great. Don't even know that one. Oh, oh Dark Castle. Dark Castle was so great. <laughs> it had such great sound effects. <laughs> You're like this dude walking through this castle in this kind of side sort of so scroller type view and there would be like bats you'd see them and if you take many steps into the room they would like head toward you you didn't want that you were armed with a very limited supply of rocks so you could throw them at the bats and it was just very satisfying they would splat on the ground <laughs> if you if you fell just a little too far but not so far that you died you'd be dizzy and you'd go Ugh, <laughs> Ugh. it was just one of those great all the details were taken care of in the game and that game was such a pain because for those of us who didn't have, had never touched a mouse before, you had to deal with, that was how oh, you yeah. aimed. And right, you're, that's true. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking of which, so I, I, you don't need a mouse for this. Small but stately child. This is Empath Abbey. So that's one complaint about this game is the, uh, you get a little heavy-handed with the <laughs> play on words. Yeah, I I mean, I guess I'm Richard Garriott's defender today. I think there's, you know, obviously he was rather young when he's still making these games. Sure. I think we could be much more critical about the game that he recently released, Shroud of the Avatar, considering by now he should probably know better. But the, the fact that this is 30 years ago, and we're not only just talking about it as like a game that advanced games, but also the fact that he is toying with ethical dilemmas in 1985 I think is fascinating. I, I think it does speak to, I don't know how, I, don't know, I, just, I think I find it so compelling that he, that we are able to walk through his imagination we've talked about. It. It's an yeah. adolescent imagination to be sure, but this is an amazing uh, viewpoint into what he's thinking about. And it's fun to play. I, I the, the Jimmy Marpy said it wasn't fun to play, but I tell you, I love getting the notes out. I love getting the map out. I do love uncovering the mysteries. It does feel in many ways similar to some of my favorite interactive interactive fiction pieces. I mean, Zork is, is Zork fun to play, but we're going to use the same thing because it's basically a game that you have to spend most of your time turned away from the computer screen, mapping mm -hmm. out each of the things. Mm -hmm. You've got to make a list of the items, right? So this is doing that same thing. Again, we're going to talk about it eventually. Last point as I continue to form the Richard Garriott fan club right now is... This you know, we, we we talk a lot about you know the the, the not, adolescent isn't the right word but the incredibly simplistic ethics side that he's and the yeah. one that's fairly problematic that doesn't that's not inconsistent, but in the next game in Ultima Five, he actually critiques this game and he makes the avatar who is becomes perfect at the end of this game, almost like the villain in the next game, mm -hmm. showing you how perfection is problematic in some of its terms and how this colonial nature that I am the shining example of what you already become is 
you know, isn't the best way to go. And I, again, we talk about how this game is responding to criticism as a part of a conversation that you don't necessarily see. Again, it's not fair to I'll say that about, I'm sure that lots of independent games do that. But in the AAA field, I think it's fascinating to see. And in the role-playing field, right, this is not a field where we usually think of asking these deep, abiding questions, right? Yeah, and I... The, the hair stands up on the back of my neck anytime someone anytime someone's criticism is it's, something's not fun mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to games because it's very subjective and right. uh, I was thinking about someone you maybe I think you mentioned Twine earlier and I was thinking about Twine this morning and very few if any Twine works. Would I consider to be fun? I would agree with that because I don't. I don't read a book expecting it to be fun. Oh gosh, yes. I mean, well, don't get me started <laughs> on the whole thing of fun as a kind of essential component of what a game is. It it that 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 fuels so many. My advisor used to talk about the politics of mereness. What kinds of things get sort of labeled as merely this or merely that, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and and the way in which, you know, well, it's not fun, so it must not be a game, and it's not worth talking about. That drives me crazy. Um, and it's just this, just in the same way you're saying about novels or anything else like that. Why are we uh, creating a litmus test around a particular subjective state? Well, it's usually to serve some pur other purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... And th the three of us have children, and their version of fun is certainly different from ours in a lot of cases. I uh, was taking my playing through th that uh, starter set D and D adventure with my two boys last night, and it's very interesting how the different versions of fun that they have is very different from mine. One is hyper violent, and the other one is. Um, much more methodical and surgical in his violence. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, all right. And I told the, I told the younger one today. I said, you know, you could always just talk to the bugbear. You could have talked to him, and the goblins would have. Uh, yeah. Oh, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I. I hmm. I can't help but think about young me playing this, and there's always a, whatever was motivating. It was always to find the NPCs, to collect mm -hmm. the other players. Yeah, yeah. Um, I loved the conversation system. It's something you wouldn't get in a wizardry or bard tale, you know. I think I mentioned this before. My favorite role playing game of all time is Temple of Abshai, which I. I I don't want to spend too much time in digression on that. But one of the commands that came with the game whenever you met a monster, it actually had a command P parlay. And I tried it on literally every creature in this game. To this day, I'm not sure that command was ever actually used. <laughs> um, but I mean, I would parlay with and men, with you know ghosts. I was so excited that one day I'd be able to have some kind of, I don't know, Eliza-esque interaction with the, you know, with the, the monsters. And this is extremely primitive, but I loved it. I had a lot of fun playing doing this. What about Marcy? Are you able to... Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So one of the commands is you can give him money, which will up your, uh, I don't know, sacrifice or compassion or something. I'd be so grateful. Let's see. But isn't that, in a nutshell, in a way, what what Weber's take on re religion is that it's the only domain of our lives that's taking on these. Sort of transcendent questions of, of the shoulds, you know, what should motivate me, what, what, what am I, you know, 
what broader thing beyond my everyday experience should be motivating my behavior? Well, that's what the game designer gets to do. Mm -hmm. You know, the interaction with the beggar in itself, in the flow of our own everyday experience, may or may not connect with some grander scheme of judgment about ourselves or give us karma or otherwise transform us. But the game designer gets to sort of say, well, just like a religion kind of does, mm -hmm. there is a system behind the everyday. There is a transcendent mm -hmm. order behind it all. You can just feel a lot more confident that that it's operating. Yeah. <laughs> Not every moment, but most moments, you know, in a game like this. Uh, there's something sort of deeply religious about games like this and what the designer is. The, the space they're occupying mm -hmm. for the player. Yeah, and it must have been a, for an open world game to how do you piece together this narrative that is somewhat arbitrary? And like that's, and I keep going back to narrative. There's this because it, that need for structure. There, it wasn't enough that we couldn't just have an open world where I can wander around and do things. It uh, wasn't like a mud, but there's this narrative here mm -hmm. that sooner or later I'm going to have to come face to face with it and deal with it and reconcile with some portion of the story that has to be met, or else I'm going to get bored with it. Maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe. maybe. Right? I mean, I think Skyrim's kind of interesting because you hear about people who play Skyrim for months and months and months and never do the main quest line. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to be a game that did an not a passable job of of being a bit like everyday life in the sense that you can just do you know the, who is it who described history as one damn thing after another you know you can <laughs> you can just do one damn thing after another yeah. with no grand coherence right or you can kind of jump on the train of that and and pursue something like that you know but yeah oh, we can yeah. Skyrim has such a biz. Huh. Um, Skyrim has a, the the thing I don't like about Skyrim, and it was a game that I that I, that I put a lot of hours into um, as soon as it came out, is that it is. We talked earlier about how you know every choice closes as many doors as it opens, but not in Skyrim. It is the most. It is the bizarrest game. It is, and it, it in many ways it's antithetical to other role playing games where I can decide I'm going to be, or to playing Dungeons and Dragons, for instance, well, I'm going to play a thief, so now I have access to thief abilities, but now I can't heal anybody, now I can't right. fight. Skyrim, you can literally, if you play long enough, be an expert in every single. My, I say this to my wife all the time whenever like something happens or I can't do something in life, I always say, life is in Skyrim. And I've been saying that for like four years, you know, <laughs> since the game came out, and she's yeah. the only one who understands what I'm saying, but right. it, it's true. It's like if I make this, to, you know, it's it's the one thing that breaks the immersion of Skyrim being truly representative of like actually how existence right. is. Yeah. That's interesting because on the in one one hand you could say it's it's overly committed to a continuous self. Your self is just infinitely available for development. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you could say it's overly committed to a discontinuity of self because you can always remake yourself as something right. completely yep. different. Yeah. It's the it's yeah. the ultimate. It's the thing I don't like about D and D. The type of players that I tend to not love playing D and D with is, is the hardcore power fantasy power gamers, right? Yeah. And I shouldn't say that. I mean, in, in every group, that they can serve a purpose, but it's not the style of gaming that I like because I like the limitations. I like the yeah. obstacles, yes. and so it's one of the reasons why, at the, after I had completed the main quest of Skyrim, I never went back. Yep. You know, I yeah. didn't. I didn't need to do everything. I liked my character, having. Yeah, I'm like. Uh, Skills dissolve and dissipate, and you know. Do they in Skyrim? Or no, I'm talking about outside of Skyrim. You know, mm -hmm. you forget things, or, um, or beco becomes obsolete. Um, I, I, I have like dozens of skills that are no longer required. <laughs> and, um, well, we we tend, you know, in in our two fields, maybe more in English than in Anthro. If you'll forgive me saying it, you know, we tend to to value or see as meaningful the narrative piece, the continuous self piece, you know, where where it isn't just 
one damn thing after another where it isn't just like oh mm-hmm. well now today does, it can be completely different it, it doesn't have to be coherent with yesterday you know but I, I think there's a lot to the idea that people are as ready to find that compelling as they are to find the bigger story mm-hmm. compelling which is sort of you know when you're playing a Skyrim right well some people for them there is no it, it was it was never about the big story right yeah you know which in twitchy type games is is very much in evidence right it's it's about the in the moment mimetic kind of can i reflect my environment my situation and target the right enemy first and take care of it before i die and do this and do that thing. that's non narrative <laughs> in a way so it's yeah. interesting when you have a game like overwatch which one of my sons right. loves, how they've taken this kind of team-based, your character is closely affiliated with what your capa- your capabilities are, and they've imposed this kind of... I don't even... I haven't even paid attention to the narrative. I can tell you what it is, but there is... There's this whole lore associated with each character and how they yeah. come... Relatively yeah. weak. Some more oh, than sure, others, sure. and some almost entirely absent, but yeah. Game or was uh, what game? I was just thinking about this game. There's some game that has literally no narrative, and I didn't know that. And so I was, I spent, and I want to say it was like an Apple II era game where I spent so much time trying to dig out, and then I eventually created my own narrative, which was just as compelling. Mm-hmm. Damn, what game was that? I think it might have been anyway. Sorry, but you know, it fine. It, it you look at the example of something like like what we're talking about, Overwatch. It that kind of in the moment mimetic action of being able to target you know the right character and, and do the right thing in the right moment take advantage of circumstance be tactical in Dusseto's sense as opposed to strategic isn't it interesting how that can inform a kind of a historical denial of the narrative, denial of other other ways of being a gamer, you know, the, and the reason the reason I think about this is that it, Overwatch is a great example of a of a game in which people will talk about online when they talk about g- gameplay skill. Oh, well, that character is not a skill, not a high skill character. Mercy is not a high skill character because she's not a point and click, super fast, perfect mm-hmm. aim, pixel perfect kind of flickability and all the rest. So so the so it's not a high skill character. Well, what the hell, right? Like <laughs> skill there is identified with this mimetic, metonymic, in the moment kind of mastery. Mm-hmm. And the lore part or game sense or any of these other the more, uh, skills that are less like athletics, you know, less like that kind of the moment get completely discounted. I just I find all that stuff fascinating because it bespeaks a particular point of view, usually a straight male, usually white male point of view mm-hmm. about what makes what is um, uh, competence in games. Mm-hmm. Anyway, maybe I'm wandering far afield. Is no, I mean we're that? we've been playing. My youngest son and I play a lot of Fortnite mm-hmm. together, and I. I confessed this to one of my students who asked if I played Counter Strike, and I said, "I did a long time ago, but now I've been playing for it." And they kind of laughed at me. There's nothing like having a student laugh at you, and you're in your face. <laughs> and but it's interesting because there's that performance quality. There's there 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 are always and that narrative or that um, right. withholding of narrative only makes for ravenous fans. Mm-hmm. To try to, all you have to do is throw mm-hmm. out red herrings, and they concoct this narrative on their own. Right. And uh, that's 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 fascinating. And it's it's an, it's an interesting. I mean, the game itself is not that compelling, it, right. but because what it what it does, it's what's more comp- it's more addictive than anything else. So, I'm gonna die. I, I, the game that I was thinking of, because I was just reading about the game. Mm-hmm. Um, the game Doom was a game that I played all of Doom 1 and Doom 2. Of course, that, you know, that completely shut down in college, practically. You know, when people, I was talking to them, was, I'm having my students watch a documentary about how Colossal Cave Adventure would shut down had departments who had access to it. But that, and I would say, obviously, I'm, you know, after the adventure era, but that's what happened with Doom. I mean, I remember people not going to classes for weeks. But 
my point was the lack of a real story in that game that made me invent one. Um, it yeah. drove me so crazy. I mean, I was like, why am I on this ship? Why are, have they invaded Earth? What is going on with the demons? And there was another point I was going to make. The, 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 I don't know if you've ever heard the quotation. I think it's either John, it's either John Romero or John Carmack, the two guys that started it. This software. I can't remember. I think it's Carmack. It was the two of them who started it together. Yeah, yeah. One of them said that you know, story in video games is like story in pornography. Like it's not it's essential. You Carmack. Know? Yeah, <laughs> um, well, but, but I see my my point is like we. Why do we why do we want to slide toward one end or the other and privilege story or privilege non story right mm -hmm. like players find compelling games that generate meaningful outcomes in my opinion uh, now that meaning can be moment to moment and not never really string together to some broad narrative structure mm -hmm. but it's still meaning yeah right. The, the contingent experience of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm working on whatever this task is in this game, and I, in the moment, notice I could do that, and then do this, and then not die because I do that. And I'm like, yes, that's awesome, mm -hmm. you know? That's a very, from a na broader narrative point of view, that starts to look empty, but it's meaningful as a moment of tactical mastery yeah. over the situation at hand, right? So I think if we want to talk about games in a way that encompasses the, the, the whole of player experiences, we have to be able to be as ready to talk about that as we are to talk about that much more continuous string together of a narrative, either you know, imposed on us by a game designer or that we find in the course of playing a game or you map onto something like Doom. But it really isn't just one end of the spectrum yeah. or the other. And like uh, my oldest son, and I hate to keep referring to my my kids, but <laughs> I, I I guess I do more of my playing through watching them anymore. <laughs> I'm the same way. Yeah. But they, uh, my oldest is playing a Persona Five. Mm -hmm. um, it's more story driven. And it's all conversation, and we'll make these you know snotty little comments like, "Are you actually going to do anything?" Because I would see this in like Final Fantasy, Tomb Raider, a lot of these more narrative right. games, and it. He says this is, I mean, this is enjoyable. This is, this is what he likes. Um, very, very little in the way of action, um, and it doesn't. So, what wouldn't be fun? This goes back to fun earlier, but but I could play Doom, at any time, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just, it's a good uh, game to pick up, and that's the purposes. If if I want to just pick it up, play about fifteen minutes of it mindless entertainment and then I'd rather do that than watch a movie mm -hmm. you know that's right no there's a yeah I mean and, and as, as somebody who's really interested in the way the game is built and create and collapse um, you know gameplay into stories I've always found it interesting that I hate Planescape Torment uh, which is often mm -hmm. you know which is a game that is often I never played greatest. even though I played a lot of their games I yeah. never played that one I finally got around to it. I'm like, I didn't play, you know, I didn't play it when it was originally released. Right. Um, finally got around, to it and I was like, that was absolutely um, incomprehensible. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that and I read the too heterogeneous? I know you, you get a lot, bunch of different. I couldn't tell you what races the story from a bunch of different places. Very chaotic setting. Is that the like the one team versus another, and it's like 200 players? No, players nope. from no, it's uh, RPG it's Infinity like and Bioware. Some, yeah. Infinity Engine came out the same time as uh, Baldur's Gate and, and uh, you know, Icewind okay. Dale. And it's based on the set of Monty Cook's... Uh, was it Monty Cook that came up with the setting? Or didn't he just make it better? Anyway, the Planescape setting for Dungeons & Dragons, which is the intersection of all these different okay. dimensions. And your character, you play the nameless one that doesn't have a name. Um, and you're trying to piece together what your past is. And you, you you can put on tattoos in your body, which give different skills. You actually change classes throughout the games. You meet a number of very compelling, very interesting characters as you go through these different dimensions. But the actual core narrative of who this character was or what they did or was so incomprehensible to me. It's, uh, I just got lost. And maybe it's too sophisticated for me. Well, it's completely the opposite of the game I was thinking of. <laughs> well, Planescape Torment often gets lauded as a novel as RPG. Here is the game where we like we you know, and it's the the amount of text in it is. You well, know. Bioware prided themselves on that in general. You know, they were they were really trying to take on that Sisyphean task of, you know, can we 
leave the player feeling like they had, you know, the, the, the breadth of agency, something like, something that echoed at least, you know, or suggested the breadth of agency they have with their own, in their own everyday experience, but yet serves some greater narrative. I didn't play Planescape, mm -hmm. but certainly Baldur's Gate, the most obvious, right? So, but is nonetheless part of some greater story that hangs together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's that's the tricky, tricky bit. But the adventure game, I mean, the, the play, I don't know, I'm... I feel like I, I want there's some of the larger concepts that we're bringing up, but like why do we why do we have to collapse things that we do in a game situation into some larger you know meaning making system? I find really fascinating, and I haven't, I haven't read enough on it, which is why I'm kind of quiet. But um, I think it's all. I was just thinking about adventure games as we're talking. The entire conceit of adventure, the classic adventure games, the point and click graphic adventure games, is that we are playing or trying to solve a puzzle just to get more of the story. That's the actual reward of it, right? And I've played RPGs that, you know, I think this, in some ways, this game does that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it doles you out little pieces of the story to keep you coming back. And it's not game, but it's not that you're mastering that tactical strategy. It's not that you've gotten past a boss. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, you have mastered a puzzle. You have, in the Nick Mon 14 sense, solved one of the riddles of how this work of this world operates. But the fact that narrative is actually a prize, I think, is interesting. Well, that, yeah, I think that's right. And I think it gets it gets to motivation <clears throat> and and the idea of, of you know what motivates us to take action. If it's the, the project of understanding could be usefully understood to be different from the project of mastery. You know, uh, they aren't necessarily the same thing. Um, so if I if I can play Tetris, you know, to a certain level beyond what I've played before, that I I, I find that very satisfying and very meaningful, but it isn't necessarily at all related to a greater degree of understanding. <laughs> right. You know? it's, the it's like an occupational Tetris. success. Like I've like you like your minor tasks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but ta oh, so I'm sorry to interrupt, no. you, Chris. No, I mean, but it's. I, there's something. I mean, Tetris is always that kind of go-to example, sure. like counterpoint to all of this. Right. Although there was the kind of strange. There, there was a narrative to it of the Russian developer. Who yeah, was, right. Who yeah, had, there's you know, that. But you don't have to know no, that to no. enjoy the game. Right? Uh, you know, it's like the Game Boy. It was even better than the arcade for that reason because there absolutely made no sense whatsoever. Um, but there was. There, it was this. I don't know, what what would you call it? Your. Um, hands-on learning, mm -hmm. you know, that, that type of uh, playing with blocks or Legos, right. I'm not sure Spatial what... Spatial reasoning, yeah. it's very, very situated, there's, it's very in the moment, it really is not leaping to logos or discourse or we want to call it representation. That domain doesn't get to sort of pretend that it's the most important thing, which yeah. is what it's very good at doing. Yeah. But I, <laughs> you know. I might argue that the, you know, um, that the, the place, I mean, I Tetris is, you're, you're ordering things. I mean, I think if we, like the quantum theory, the idea for collapsing possibilities into, like you have to collapse them into possibilities that all make sense, right? That you cannot have blocks that are not touching. You can't have uh, open oh, things. That, it's, your, that, your, it's organizational, I think. I, I do think... It's an abstraction of collapsing narratives. You're going to enjoy my course so much, <laughs> Scott. I can't wait for you to read it. Oh, yes, I hear what you're saying, but I think that's a little bit of a cheat, right? It's a, it's a cheat to say that any ordering is necessarily moving into the realm of discourse, right? Anthony Giddens, social theorist, uh, I think charts out in a bit of an interesting way uh, how even in our practical experience of the world, I'm kind of drawing on phenomenologists, and he draws on, on Irving Goffman quite a bit, who you reading for Friday, um, that to, to be human in the world, in, in, at least in part, is to experience this kind of um, uh, impetus toward ontological security, which is how do I how do I know that the world is a reliable environment in which to act, right? How it is neither too chaotic nor too routinized for me to feel like I have some capacity to engage it actively have some reliable expectations about what will follow from my actions. Um, now that, that ordering of a sort, and I think it's a mistake to take it too far and think of it as a set ordering. I think one of the nice things about it is it's kind of a reliableist epistemology. It doesn't have to have a perfect sense making behind me every day, but it just has to feel ordered enough for you to be able to get on with doing things, right? That's, I would argue, not in the realm of representation. It doesn't have to be. 
it's it's a practical experience of a reliable yeah. environment in which to act. So meaning hasn't, in that sense, in the discursive sense, hasn't necessarily, it isn't it's not reducible to to a, a dis discourse based or represent representation based account, which isn't. You know, it's a practice coming in to, to representation and saying, hey, maybe there's something to practice that isn't reducible to representation right. in the human experience of the world. And I think, I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. It's going to be a long semester for you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got well, Chris, I was you've gonna, Chris to ask. I <laughs> Chris is the expert on this course. I was going to bring it back to Ultima Four, which I don't know. But see, now, I'm, now I'm lost in, in those thoughts. But the idea that in some ways, you know, these games offer... Um, enough structure and meaning for us to engage with them in ways that we might not get in our actual lives, which is what I think in some ways is very appealing about role-playing games. Yeah. I was just trying to find some type of bridge to Ultima 4. I don't know if I can, but... Um, can, I, can I jump in? Yeah. Try I, to help? I mean, I go back to Richard Garriott. I mean, who, at a time as a child where he had a hard time finding his place in the world where we all have at that age had a hard time finding our place in the world but here he is um, kind of not bullied I don't know but um, you know was an out was out of place right and so he creates his own place and this is what I think games allow us to do if we're fortunate enough to make them uh, one of the great things about D&D is that anyone can kind of create a place. Um, I think uh, Chuck mentioned this last week on Wednesday, of this desire to create a world or fashion a world based on an existing one. Um, the, the problem is, is that there is that order for, and once you've got this space, you've created this world for everyone, it does kind of have this, you want people to enjoy it or get the same type of meaning that, uh, that you get out of yeah. that you put into it but it just doesn't uh, I love thinking about No Man's Sky one of the great by, all, by many accounts great failure in video games because it just failed to deliver what it supposedly promised and I, there's a perfect example of the space that was created just wasn't what people wanted or Mass Effect 3 the, mm -hmm. there was the, 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 the most disappointing uh, contemporary narrative as far as games go because I think people are expect we're now conditioned to to get a product that delivers and I just and it's always in, I think it's gonna be it's a hard yeah. bar to, to live up to as a side note I'm just kind of leaving it here because How did you find work, Bruce? I died. <laughs> oh, okay. I died and I, we were resurrected here. But I thought this might be a good point to, if we start up again next, do it again next week, we'll mm -hmm. start in Britannia. Well, I don't, yeah, oh, we should, we can talk offline. I mean, the, the problem is, like, how do you play these games over a Twitch stream, you know, without us sitting here literally with graph paper and a notebook? I mean, the conversations are mm -hmm. amazing, but I don't know how much we can. And it always drives me crazy every time I leave this, we talk about fun. I, I can't not watch you play and not literally just want to go downstairs to my office and start breaking out the paper and start doing it, you know? I had the same experience with Ultima 3, yeah. too. Um, of course, I don't have the time to do well, it. Well, I mean, why wouldn't we do that? Well, that's you know, a, yeah. I, I like the idea. Yeah. We're, we just have to go in knowing that that's the plan. And, and you could even have fun sort of given that the environment makes it possible, uh, charting new ways to do it that are not just yourself trying to play it as a single player. Yeah. You know, and collaboratively do all the in and beyond game stuff required. And maybe chat could get involved too, you know, if we have people on. Yeah, I, mean, I always, I did not own this game until I was much older um, I always went to a friend's house and played it and one person always took the notes and jotted things yeah. down so it's interesting that like this was it, it is, this was always a social game to me it was mm. never far from uh, most computer games for that yeah. for that matter were always social to me because we didn't have one for a long time and when I did have one in late years of high school we had friends over and all sat around a computer screen so I'm 
totally down with taking notes and cool. Because I don't remember how to get around this world anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like fun. At some level, you get you know spells that will tell you like your exact actual longitude and latitude. But even I, you know, even in the forty hours I sunk into it, I wasn't even able to get there. It, it, if someone else was interested in playing, I could uh, put a get an Evernote or something up there, and we could put it online so people could have access to it. We put on the we got to talk about the blog at some point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> good stuff. It really, I, I don't know. I, one of those few games that I remember so vividly actually playing it when it first came out. Like, I still remember being in Florida, my grandparents' home with the Apple IIc um, on, you know, right there. Um, probably because I, it was such an immersive game. I, I should, I, I'm, I'm being half, I'm, I'm obviously being facetious, but because and we, we didn't even talk about this a lot but be, because of the, that belief structure that i believe that i believed that this was a fully functioning world where people were going about their business despite the fact that yeah. i'm represented by strange little sprites and now as an adult i you know i can tell obviously that these are it's, it's extremely you know primitive as far as like how npcs might operate in a skyrim but at the same time it, it just it seemed you know endless possibilities that i sunk i sunk so many hours in this game as a kid and i never saw a dungeon once um mm -hmm. You know, I just, I could talk to these characters forever. Well, they, this game, I mean, this was one of those first games that satisfies, I think, a social need. I mean, if you're playing this by yourself, I mean, even me playing it with another, another person, there was a social, that, like, that desire to explore, to go up to just random strangers and strike up conversations. I could never do that in real yeah. life. At yeah, that was yeah. a big part of it for me too. Absolutely. And this was this enabled you to do that. I mean, the all of the entrapments of D and D were were kind of secondary to that. Uh, and I, and I, this is I mean, one of my big arguments in my work now is that games are providing us with um, outlets for things that we just don't have access to anymore. Hmm. That's a good note to end yeah. on, I think. All right. So, uh, well, I guess we'll be here next week with graph paper and... <laughs> <laughs> I will come in cosplay, full cosplay next week Great. as well. Yeah. Um, as an aside, next week I'm going to bring... So, uh, last little comment. I, it was interesting. Over the weekend, and I wanted to bring it today, over the weekend... Um, I got, I'd supported the Kickstarter for Shroud of the Avatar, Richard Garriott's MMO, which is supposed to be a descendant of these Ultima games, which I have played a little bit, and it's been a fairly disappointing experience playing, and I don't have the time for an MMO. But the box came, because I supported the Kickstarter at the $150 level, back before I was a grad student again. And, <laughs> um, you know, same artist, and I think I'll bring it in, oh, you can wonderful. have it take oh, a look cool. at it. It's disappointing, because it's... And so the other thing I want to mention is it actually comes with... Uh, a little manual that shows Richard Garriott's D and D notes from his first mm. campaign, okay. um, which is kind of fun to look at. So I'll bring that That's in next neat. week. Cool. Yeah, and uh, the net, uh, the uh, OBS interface will play around with that too, so get some of these images up there, that so we can look fun. at those rather than holding them up to a camera. Awesome. Great. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.